Hello all, thank you so much for joining us for today's uh, Audubon page turning event, uh, the April 2021 edition. My name is Marika van der Steenhoven and I'm coming to you live from the George J. Mitchell Department of Special Collections and Archives, which is located on the third floor of the Hawthorne Longfellow Library here on Bowdoin's campus in Brunswick. And I'm joined as always by... <laughs> dyslexic. <laughs> Kat Stefko, who is our department director. Um, we Again, we are so excited um, to welcome you here today, and we are so thrilled um, to welcome our special guest, Marshall Eiliff, who um, we'll be hearing from shortly. Before we dive in um, to today's program, I just want to make sure that uh, some of our upcoming programs are on your radar. We've got a couple of fabulous programs coming up and I'm so excited to share them with you. Two, um, the first is part of our Beyond the Reading Room Archives in the World series, which seeks to highlight the archival research um, of various people who are connected to Bowdoin. And on April 9th, which is a next Friday at noon, Kid Wongsrich Anilai, um, who is Bowdoin class of 2003, will be giving a talk entitled, Nothing Like Having a Good Repository, the Archive as Teacher, Counselor, and Diversifier of the Past. Kid is currently serving as the Director of Research at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, so we encourage you to come and learn about the research that he did here at Bowdoin as an undergrad and how that um, kind of prompted him and pushed him into the, the career that he is in today. On April 13th, we're delighted to welcome um, and to co-host a program with the Peary McMillan Arctic Museum. We'll be welcoming another Bowdoin alum to our series. Um, and this is Spencer Apollonio, who is a research scientist who has taken over a dozen trips to the Arctic. He'll be in conversation with Jenny Lemoyne of the Arctic Museum. And that'll happen on Tuesday, April 13th at noon. And the final event I want to make sure that you know about is our May page turning event. We're so delighted to welcome yet another Bowdoin alum. It's incredible how many fabulous alums there are and in, in so many diverse areas um, that connect to the work that we do here in special collections and archives. And um, we'll be welcoming Peter Logan, who is class of 1975, who is the author of a fabulous um, Audubon biography. So we're excited to welcome him. That'll be March 9th at 1230 p.m. Um, if you're in attendance today, you do need to register for that event. Um, you can find all of our events listed on our website, which is library.bowden.edu backslash arch, as in archives. Awesome. Okay, so today's speaker. Marshall Eiliff fell in love with nature as a young child exploring the fields and forests near his home in Annapolis, Maryland. After attending a National Wildlife Federation camp at age 11, he fell in love with birds and has devoted his life to enjoying and understanding them. After graduating from Bowdoin in 1997, Marshall worked on ornithological field jobs around the country, including a Virginia hawk watch and surveys for migrating birds on an oil drilling platform in the Gulf of Mexico. He led bird watching tours for Victor Emanuel Nature Tours for seven years, traveling widely, including favorite destinations like Alaska, West Mexico, Panama, and Kenya. In 2007, Marshall joined the Cornell Lab of Ornithology as project leader for eBird, which you can find out more about at www.ebird.org, which is a free website where all birders can keep their personal records, track their lists, and see what others are seeing. The open access database has become invaluable to the science and conservation communities and continues to grow and is expected to surpass a billion records in spring of 2021. eBird is truly revolutionizing how birders contribute to the understanding and protection of the birds they love. Marshall lives in Dedham, Massachusetts with his wife, who is also an alum of class of 97, son and two dogs. Um, and we're so delighted to have you here with us today, Marshall. Um, now I'm going to switch over my camera and um, I'm going to make the requisite flip the bird joke. Um, so Kat and I are going to gather um, around Audubon's 
Birds of America. This is the double elephant folio edition. You will notice that Kat and I both have bare hands, but we've just washed them. Um, you may have an idea in your mind about uh, handling rare books with, uh, with white gloves on and that actually you can lose a sense of tactility. So we're gonna approach this amazingly huge book that takes two people to turn the pages and it has been on view in the Hawthorne Long Fellow Library, excuse me, since uh, it was donated in 1955. Um, all right, let's see. There's the bird. We're saying goodbye to the red-shouldered hawk. If you missed last month's page turning, there is a recording. We had ornithologist Scott Widensall um, talk to us about Birds of Maine, the recent publication, as well as um, waxing some beautiful poetics on the red-shouldered hawk. So you can check out that recording if you missed it and get a close-up of that bird. And here we go. And I'll do some fancy camera work here. Is it focused? It, I believe it's focused. How's that look to everyone? That looks focused to me. Whoop, whoop. Let's go this way. There we go. Fabulous. So we're going to turn things over to you, Marshall. Thank you again for joining us. And we're so excited to hear all that you have to say. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thanks a lot. That's that's uh, super fun to see. It's it's fun to see just how big, uh, how big that book is. Um, uh, I don't know if I've ever actually seen um, an original in this way, but um, super cool. So um, so this is showing two loggerhead shrikes. They're uh, they're really territorial birds. So these two are sort of engaged in a bit of a squabble, which is something they do often, and then the. The thing you'll really want to notice is that the bird on the right is standing on a mouse that it likely has impaled on a little thorn or a little broken branch or something. Um, and that's a behavior that's uh, that's really interesting, unique to, <laughs> unique to shrikes. I, uh, I need to pause for a quick second because I just realized my battery is super low. <laughs> so if I can go I, I didn't, I'm sitting outside and it's chilly and I think that made my battery drop real quick. Let me uh, scramble real quick and get set back up. I'm really sorry to- uh, Oh, no worries. So, so while Marshall grabs his charger, I mean, these are the things that we, these are the things that we encounter in a, in a pandemic <laughs> world where we do virtual page turnings. Can um, we zoom around and yeah. move around the image? While we we can move moment. around the image a little bit. I also want to remind you, that um, as Marshall shares his talk with us, you are welcome to enter your questions into the Q&A forum. Um, so as he talks um, and mentions things, you're, you are absolutely welcome to, to share your questions with us. I also, if you wanna join a community conversation in terms of what what birds you've been seeing lately. Um, I was so delighted. I was um, out in Westbrook uh, last weekend and saw a glossy ibis on the side of the road. Um, Marshall has recently seen a pine warbler. Um, oh, they're chirping in his backyard uh, as he speaks. And Kat, you mentioned that your husband saw a- Peregrine falcon. A peregrine falcon. In our neighborhood for the yeah. first time. Yeah, wow, in the Brunswick area. So. Um, if you'd like to join the chat and share some birds you've seen recently, please do that. Um, or the Q&A forum for specifically a question for um, Marshall. And it looks like he has joined us again. Welcome back. <laughs> All right, that was a little embarrassing. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no apologies now, necessary. Now inside and more comfortable also. So um, <laughs> anyway, I was starting to say, um, yeah, take take note of the mouse that's uh, stuck on a thorn or stuck on a branch there, because that's one of the fundamental, um, the really unique things about shrikes. So shrikes are actually passerine birds, um, 
passer inverts are the ones that have kind of three toes forward, one toe back, and are typically uh, known as songbirds. So I was going to jump to a video. Um, And now that I'm inside, my four-year-old is running around and may interrupt, Sorry. but, <laughs> and that's, this is my <laughs> wife, class of 97. Hi, class of 97. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Here we go. Can, can you see that video? Three, come on up. One. Yes, we can see the video. <laughs> can you hear the discipline happening in the background? <laughs> oh, yes, it's fabulous. <laughs> okay, so so like I said, shrikes are songbirds, um, but they're not very impressive. This is actually a, a singing loggerhead shrike on a wire. Um, so you know, a lot of typical typical songbirds, you know, you think about Mockingbird is something that has a really, um, really dynamic song. Um, warblers, sparrows, all have these really complex songs, but but shrikes are really sort of um, some of the most basal. So some of the most kind of original songbirds kind of as, as birds were just developing, um, you know, they're like, they're, they're, Singing structures just aren't as aren't as advanced, aren't as well developed as as a lot of the a lot of the birds that we think about as songbirds. Um, so I'm going to show one more video while I'm in sort of video mode to give a sense for that behavior of uh, as one of the predatory songbirds. Um, so people think about shrikes as being kind of the predatory songbirds, but the truth is almost all songbirds are predators because they eat insects. They feed feed insects to their young. Um, but you can see that real hooked bill that sort of recalls a hawk. I'll, I'll play it one more time um, just to watch how this thing is sort of manipulating this caterpillar. Um, and, and it's basically smashing it against the branch to, um, to kill it and then eat it. Um, you'll also see them sometimes really manipulate things with their feet, which I will come back to a little bit later. Um, so that's a that's a shrike in action. Um, I am going to stop sharing and jump to a PowerPoint real quick. Um, it's not showing up showing up well with a nice pretty picture of a shrike on a green background. Hopefully, yeah, it looks great. Okay, so this is uh, this is a loggerhead shrike. Um, like I like I say that that um, that hooked bill is a real characteristic of shrikes and and sort of unique among passerines or songbirds. Um, they they're often known as butcher birds because of that behavior of um, both being predatory and impaling their prey on on thorns or 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 barbed wire. Um, and shrikes shrikes are really really distinctive. Uh, loggerhead shrikes really distinctive in North America for being you know these totally gray birds with that really striking dark mask, black wings, that little check of white, white in the wings, and a dark tail. Um, but there's a lot of shrikes in the world. Um, there's only two shrikes in the Americas, but all these other shrikes uh, live around the world. So there's a lot of shrikes in Africa and across Eurasia, and especially Southeast Asia. Um, they're generally gray and black birds, um, but you can see a lot of them have these really beautiful reddish or rufous tones. Um, some of the, yeah, the things like the bullheaded shrike up at top is a is an East Asian one that you find in Korea. Um, Woodchat shrike down at the bottom left is a real colorful one that that you can find across Europe. And then sort of the rest of that row is where the loggerhead shrike is. That's it's sort of this typical typical shrike with a dark mask, dark wings, and and that little spot of spot of white in the wings. Um, but all these ones we've re recently worked out the genetics on really complex relationships on sort of um, what the species are because because a lot of these look so similar. Um, it's kind of taken advanced genetics to kind of figure out where the species limits break out on these, especially kind of those bottom bottom three at the right. Um, that look really similar, but but in fact, 
Um, those are sort of the divisions in them. So here's another another just pretty pretty image of a of a loggerhead shrike. Um, one thing that tends to be distinctive about them, they really like to sit up on prominent perches, and they sit up there and kind of scan the grasslands below, looking for looking for prey. Um, they're really territorial. So here here are two sort of engaged in a territorial squabble, and and it's really showing off that white white band. So the the flight feathers on a bird are the um, you know the the outer the outer longer feathers are the primaries. So shrikes have this white band at the base of the primaries that creates this crescent in the in the wing when they're flying. Um, and if they're not sitting on a high perch, they're often sitting on a, a wire. They're like one of the most common birds to see up on telephone wires in places that shrikes live, um, or they really really like barbed wire fence. Um, and and this one at the bottom is actually a, a juvenile. Um, loggerhead shrike, so probably just out of the out of the nest for a month or so, which is why the feathers look kind of fluffy and um, and and they have that nice nice band of of kind of buffy color in the midwing. Um, and you can see real fine barring in the crown and and breast. They only hold that plumage for for a month or two before they molt in to look like the adult up at the up at the top right. Um, but they really like these barbed wire fences because they. They often use it to impale prey. Um, as I was looking around for photos, it was it was sort of fun to find this one with an earthworm impaled on a barbed wire fence because I, you think about robins eating worms. I don't really think about shrikes doing it. Um, but um, but really, what what loggerhead shrikes probably focus on the most are are things like the bottom left, like the grasshoppers. Um, big insects are are probably their main prey, but they're sort of most famous for eating things like snakes and lizards. Um, they will eat small birds. Um, they will eat mice, like in that in that Audubon painting. But but again, these big insects, um, like at the bottom, are, are sort of the 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 main prey source for for shrikes. Um, so they tend to do really well in southern areas where you get a lot of like big beetles, and uh, that's a that's a green darner dragonfly that the one at the bottom right has. Um, so, so those big insects really form a big part of their diet. Um, and then there's there's sort of two birds that are most commonly confused with loggerhead shrike. Um, the first one is at the top. The top right is the northern shrike, which is the one other shrike that that occurs in in North America. That's actually the shrike that you'd be likely to see in Maine. Um, they nest up in northern Canada and Alaska, and then they migrate down. Um, to sort of the northern tier of U.S. states, um, as far south as Texas, but but on the East Coast, only really about as far south as as New York and, and Pennsylvania. Um, they look a lot like loggerhead shrike, but they're bigger, so they're more likely to to take birds as prey. And I don't know if people have been able to identify the bird that this one's sitting on, but it's an evening grosbeak, which is a pretty big bird. Um, probably you know at least half the half the way to the northern shrike, maybe maybe closer to two thirds. Um, so northern shrikes are even more voracious predators than, than loggerheads. Um, and the other ways that they differ are really pretty subtle, but they, they do tend to have more barring on the breast. They have a longer bill with a stronger hook. They tend to have um, a less prominent mask that actually starts below the eye instead of including the eye, which you see on the, the bird on the left. Um, and often the two don't overlap in range. So loggerhead shrike is sort of a, a southern southern species, and northern shrike um, really nests in the far north. And and in winter, um, the northerly populations of loggerhead shrike migrate away, and the, the northern shrikes move in. So sometimes time of year can help you help give a clue to what shrike you're seeing. Um, and then the other bird that they're often confused with is is northern mockingbird, which is at the bottom. Um, obviously, the bills are totally different. Um, mockingbirds actually have gray wings instead of black wings, and the, the pattern of white in the wing is, is a little bit different. But when people really want to see a shrike, they can often, often manage to see a mockingbird and say, ah, I just saw a shrike. But um, <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, that's those two. It, it turns out that shrikes are sort of most closely related to vireos. And if you have like an old Peterson book, you'll see vireos sitting right next to warblers and Sort of talking about how similar you know, vireos and warblers are because they're about the same size. But in truth, 
um, evolutionarily speaking, and when you start to really understand their behavior, vireos are much more like shrikes and warblers um, are kind of from a totally different branch of the, the singing birds, the, the passerine birds. Um, and one of the things that you notice about vireos is they have these thick legs that they use to kind of manipulate prey and these pretty thick, almost shrike-like bills that they use to, to really tackle large, large insects with. And if you watch them feed, they'll bang things against the branch kind of the same way that, that we saw that shrike doing in the video. Um, so this is a yellow-throated vireo migration map. Um, and this is, this is drawing on eBird data and showing that yellow-throated vireos, and a lot of the vireos are really highly migratory species. So this one uh, breeds across the east. Its, its northern limit is right about the Bowdoin campus in Maine. Um, and then they spend the winter in Central America, um, just barely sneaking into South America. Um, so I have this full migration where the entire breeding population vacates the United States and goes to Central America for the winter. So this, and this is a similar map for a loggerhead shrike. And you'll see this, this bird is much less migratory. You'll see it fill in kind of the Southern Prairie provinces in the summertime and then migrate away. During that time in winter, that's when the Northern shrikes move into that same, same area and probably are, are feeding on mice and, and songbirds um, while the loggerhead shrikes are going farther South to look for, look for areas with lots of, lots of bugs and lizards that they, that they tend to prefer. Um, but this gives a sense that some of the populations of loggerhead shrike are just there all year long, like in the Central Valley of California and in West Mexico and Texas. Um, and then we have this population that's migratory. Um, one of the old names for sort of the northern, um, northern populations of loggerhead shrike was migrant shrike. And this, uh, this sort of shows that, um, that we do have this migratory population and non-migratory population. Um, so I'll just talk quickly about, about what I do and how it connects to, to shrikes and birds. Um, so so I, I do work for this project eBird that, um, that was founded in 2002. And every dot on this map is an eBird checklist. So these are checklists from bird watchers like myself who go out um, recreationally or even, even on, on professional field jobs and keep a, keep a tally of all the birds they observe. So every one of those is sort of a scientific survey. Um, you can quantify how many birds are found by how much time you spend in the field and how much distance you cover. And then we can use that to calculate abundance. And that's, that's what those maps you just saw were. Those were abundance maps for basically every day of the year for a yellow-throated vireo and a loggerhead shrike. Um, so it, as, as was said in the introduction, eBird's about to cross a billion records, uh, which is pretty mind-blowing uh, progress. And a big part of that is that it's this fully global uh, project with smartphone apps where you can record the birds right when you see them in Spanish or Chinese or Thai or Turkish or Russian. Um, so it's been been really gratifying to be part of such a global project. Um, and it's been really successful by tapping into the, the bird watcher mindset. Um, if any of you are bird watchers or no bird watchers, you know, a lot of them just really love their bird lists. Um, and so we built eBird to be this kind of ultimate way for bird watchers to track what they see and where they see it, whether it's all the birds you've seen in the world in your life or all the birds you've seen in the state of Maine in your life, um, to give them all the tools to kind of track their records and store those and pull up all their sightings of loggerhead shrike anywhere. Um, and then we, we process and visualize that data in ways that are really useful for people trying to learn about birds. So on the right, we have the um, what we call the illustrated checklist that gives the seasonal occurrence for um, a set of species in and around the shrikes. And you can see that pattern of Northern shrike coming into Maine um, as late as late May and returning as, as early as the second week of October, but with most birds being seen between November and March. Um, and then for loggerhead shrike, you can see it's really not a species that occurs in Maine, but every now and then one turns up and, and becomes a huge sensation for bird watchers to go see. Um, and then it's nested in among its closest relatives, the vireos and the, the crows and jays. Um, so that's, that's eBird. Um, eBird data feed out into a lot of other projects that we work on at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And one of the, one of the ones that I hope everyone knows about, or, and if you don't, I hope you check it out afterwards, is Merlin. Um, Merlin's a, a free smartphone app 
that's basically a global field guide for any birds in the world. So if you want to find out about loggerhead shrike, you can search that up and, and just get a short description of what they are, some really nice photos, the, the audio recordings of the sound, and a range map. Um, and then the other thing you can do in Merlin on the right side is for any location in the world, and this is um, this one's set for um, somewhere like Peru, I think. Um, you can check out um, check out the occurrence of species there, uh, and just say, you know, get off the plane if you're ever able to travel again, and say what birds are around me, and find out about tropical kingbirds, rufous collared sparrows, great thrushes, um, things that you don't tend to see here in in North America. Um, and then the other piece is sort of this. This middle part is the magic of image recognition that we're working on, which is take a picture of any bird, zoom in, and let our algorithm try to help you with the identification. It's not right 100% of the time, so it's sort of like asking an expert friend, like, what do you think this bird is? And this one actually is an oven bird. Um, and then as soon as you do that, then you can check out, again, additional photos, explore the details, and, and hear them sing. Um, and the other piece that we're working on right now and should be out by the summer is the the voice recognition so you can actually hold your phone up and and get get help from your smartphone on, on identifying the bird songs in real time um, and the one other project i wanted to highlight is the birds of the world project which is really complete life life histories for all the all the birds in the world um, birds of north america was sort of the the original project that this was was built on that, that it gives these really detailed life history accounts for all species. Um, but that's been expanded recently through a partnership with uh, Handbook of Birds of the World to to deliver online resources for all 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 birds across the planet. Um, and it's totally integrated with eBird and 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 Merlin and the Macaulay Library of, of videos and sounds, which which is where all the videos and sounds I've been showing have been coming from. Um, and uh, and so this integrated resource is a really rich uh, rich way to find out everything you could ever want to know about loggerhead strike is on those pages. Um, but then take a look at this range map at the bottom right, and this is sort of where I'm going to end. Um, here's 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 that range of of loggerhead strike um, from kind of a traditional range map, and this is this is what you'd probably see in your in your field guides. But here it is alongside our current eBird data. Um, so instead of that animated migration, what we're seeing here is the red areas are the breeding areas, the blue areas are the wintering areas, and the purple areas are the ones where the birds um, are present year round, which pretty much matches, the, and I should say the yellow, the yellow areas are the migration only regions. Um, and those are the, that's the same color scheme on the right, but you'll see some, some huge differences there. Um, First of all, clearly the person doing the one on the right didn't know what the status was in Mexico because there's this hard boundary at the Rio Grande that doesn't match biological reality. Um, so a big part of our efforts now is to take take real time observations from bird watchers, um, run some really advanced statistics on those to make sure that we account for all the variability in how how bird watchers report their birds, and predict at very very fine scale. So these are are um, three kilometer predictions for loggerhead shrike occurrence at a single pixel around the around the um, around North America. Um, and the the darker colors are obviously where they're more likely to be found. Um, but the thing the thing you'll really notice here is that entire eastern half of the population is basically gone. And so that is a that is one of the big stories with loggerhead shrike is is that it is a species in very serious decline. And has been for for decades. Um, I grew up in Maryland, and it used to be possible to go to Western Maryland and see loggerhead shrikes, and they've completely disappeared from there. You'll see this range map shows them wintering in New Jersey, and there probably hasn't been a, a loggerhead shrike in New Jersey um, in the past several years. Uh, there's a few individual pairs still in Virginia. Um, those actually show up as little pixels on this map, but then. Um, the, the population in the Southeast has crashed. Um, they're still holding on in the Carolinas and Georgia, but much more localized than they were when this map was drawn. Um, and even in areas where they're common, like, like coastal California in the Southwest, uh, we see very, very steep declines in basically every, every bit of bird counting data um, that we have. 
Um, you can see also they've totally disappeared from kind of southwestern California. It, they don't do well in urban landscapes, so they're they're effectively gone from Los Angeles. Um, so the reasons for these declines are are pretty clearly changes in how we do agriculture. Um, use of a lot of pesticides kills a lot of bugs, probably gets into the systems of the shrikes. Um, but but we're also just doing these mega farms now that that don't leave a lot of margins that have um, have bugs and grass and uh, just appropriate habitat for for shrikes that like to like to live in hedge hedgerows and hunt in short grass along the edges of fields and things. So, um, yeah, being able to um, to identify these declines and and understand why they're happening is really really the main goal of everything we're doing at the Lab of Ornithology to try to try to better understand bird populations and try to try to protect them because because certainly in Audubon's time there were a lot of shrikes around in the Northeast and. Um, talking about migrant strikes was just a just a normal thing even up in New England, but it's uh, sort of a thing of the past. Um, so so we hope to hope to stop the decline and and see more strikes all across the country. So anyway, I can take questions from here. Marshall, thank you so much. That was just so fabulous. Um, we, I was on mute because Kat and I were just sitting here going, oh, wow. And oh my goodness, you're making all sorts of uh, noises um, so <laughs> in appreciation of all that you shared. So thank you so much. Um, I really am into the idea of there was the images that you shared really illustrated the uh, shrike as a butcher butcher bird, which is fun. <laughs> So again, you can submit your questions in the Q&A um, forum. We had a couple of questions, but in the course of your talk, um, it looked like you answered them. I did have an email um, from a student. Again, this is Marika talking, not the shrikes, but I figured you'd probably rather look at those birds than, than my face. Um, so this was a question sent to me uh, earlier today from a student who wasn't able to make the talk, um, but is looking forward to the recording. This is from Jeff, who is class of 22. My question is, do you think eBird has changed the landscape of birding for the better? I appreciate being able to look at eBird reports to find things I haven't seen before, but I also saw the negative side of this this fall when people flocked to and harassed a long-eared owl. Maybe this is an inevitability and word would get out either way, but I'm curious to hear whether you think this sort of thing is eBird's responsibility or if it falls on the individual to keep it a secret. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. It's something we really grapple with is, um, I mean, we're, we're all, you know, thrilled with, with sort of how eBird has been used to advance science. And there, there are tons of papers, um, you know, literally dozens of papers every year coming out, drawing on eBird data for new revelations about um, bird evolutionary history, um, conservation, Conservation prioritization is a huge thing to to be able to overlay um, all the abundance information and and figure out what areas you know when we have limited conservation dollars how do we prioritize that and and uh, and focus on specific things um, it's been used in a lot of lot of local land scale protection um, just just to be able to have data on birds at everyone's fingertips um, and there there are whole swaths of the planet where we don't even know basic bird biology that the eBird and the ability to, to collect photos that are date and location specific are, are really revealing bird biology, variation in plumage, um, even just the basics of where birds occur for the first time. So I, I have no problem saying that it is absolutely a huge benefit to, to birds overall. Um, but there is this issue of sort of birds being loved to death, um, which, is, which is the long-eared owl example. Um, owls in particular, like, really draw a lot of attention, and a lot of eBird is sort of built to share information about about where birds are. And for almost all species, that's a great thing. But for owls, it's pretty it get, can be pretty complicated if a, if an individual bird is sort of being harassed. Um, so, in my state in Massachusetts, there's been a a pair of long-eared owls up at Salisbury State Park um, in the far north, right on the coast. Um, and those ones actually sort of got reported on eBird early on, and it was a big concern about whether people were going to get too close and flush them and disturb them. And the park staff came in and, and actually set out a barricade to protect the roosting mm -hmm. area, and then people could view the birds with telescopes from a distance. So I, 
you know, I, I think it's very, very possible to have people enjoy birds. And I think just the act of enjoying birds is a good thing. Like hopefully, you know, hopefully those people that are out actively enjoying birds and, and benefiting from eBird and kind of helping them to see more birds are also stopping and thinking like, what can I do in the voting booth in my local community, um, you know, giving to giving to organizations that are out to protect habitat and, and protect birds. So I, like, I do think just boosting people's awareness of birds and interest in birds is a, is a net benefit societally. And I do think that owls, owls can be loved and seen and managed in a way that, um, that is responsible. But we do, we do have some birds that we basically um, hide, hide in eBird because uh, there's too much of a risk to the birds from either bird watchers visiting or, or sometimes even poachers or, or bird trappers that might target those birds. So it's a, it's a challenge for us to have kind of this very open platform, but also to be thinking about when, when might that actually be a cost to the birds. Awesome, thank you. Um, the next question is from Parker, uh, who says, um, thanks for the great presentation. I was wondering how you correct your predictions of where birds occur for the fact that you're more likely to see a bird where there are more people looking, like Florida. Yeah, so I glossed over that pretty quickly when I was showing the um, animated migration maps, but it's a, there's a lot of very deep uh, statistics and machine learning that goes into those models that I showed. And basically what they're doing is, is chopping the whole planet up into what we call stixels. So those are spatiotemporal um, lat long blocks. Um, and in a place like New England, those would be pretty small um, in, in, because there's a lot of data there. But in a place like Brazil, they'd be very large because we don't, we don't have a lot of data there. So, so the, the spatial resolution in areas with dense data will be better. But, but we try to grab sort of a comparable amount of data um, and let the sizes vary. And then the way those overlap allows us to make predictions um, in ways that allow kind of the biogeographical patterns and temporal patterns to come out. So, so it's basically like, instead of one model that's showing that, it's like hundreds of thousands of individual models all overlaid on top of each other, sort of corrected for statistically, correcting for the variability in eBird data. So eBird is not a, a lot of bird surveys are very standardized that say go out for 10 minutes, count all the birds you can see within 100 meters of you, and then we can extrapolate that out. What eBird says is just go bird watching, tell us how far you went, ideally kind of keep a track on your phone, and then we'll use the statistics on how far you went, what time of day it was, and, and how long you spent looking um, on our side. To, to do that correction for sort of birds per distance or birds per hour. Um, so anyway, that hopefully that helps a little bit. There's, there's a lot of very complex statistics that, that are above my pay grade to understand <laughs> going in this, but, it, um, but I can also say that the, the products that come out are exactly, exactly the range that, that we see for, for loggerhead shrike. Um, and, and these models are getting better and better over the years. And um, you know, our current challenge is how do we model in Africa where we have big gaps in the Sahara where basically no one's bird watching. Um, but it's an ongoing, ongoing challenge for us to sort of truly accurately model birds all around the world on every day of the year for 10,000 wow. species. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Thank you. I feel like, yeah, that was a really wonderful sort of slicing of that. Um, our next question is from Victoria, and it looks like it's a three-parter. Um, she says, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. I'm wondering whether you have a favorite bird and what you find the most rewarding aspect of birding. And then in addition, any Massachusetts specific birding organizations to get involved with that you can recommend, especially for a beginning birder. <laughs> All right, uh, well, <laughs> I, I get asked favorite bird a lot and I and I've just, taken the approach of like whatever bird hits hits my mind at that moment is my favorite bird because <laughs> I definitely like part of what I love about birds is their diversity but every bird I have so you know every bird I've ever seen I certainly have some relationship with and I'm you're definitely not going to get me to say anything but loggerhead shrike now because I've spent 
<laughs> not just 30 minutes now talking about them, but some lead up time thinking about them. And uh, and loggerhead shrikes are just amazing birds. When it, when I grew up in Annapolis, it was right at this tail end of this decline. Um, but I, I lived in a place that actually had some big fields around it. And, and in two or three separate years, I had loggerhead shrikes passing through as migrants. And they were rare enough at that time that I would, you know, tell friends and people would sort of flock to the area around my yard to come see these shrikes passing through right now. I, I think I actually saw them on April 1st and 2nd in a couple of years. Um, so this is like exactly the time that those last sort of migrant shrikes were, were passing through in Maryland. Um, I can also say that the last loggerhead shrike I saw was the day last fall when the election was called because I remember going out of my way to go see this strike that that showed up in Plymouth County and a lot of bird watchers were going to see and I remember the news breaking almost as I pulled into the strike spot and running into a friend there where we could uh, talk politics and, and look at the bird um, so so loggerhead strike is definitely definitely my favorite bird <laughs> tomorrow might be something else um, yeah good good organizations to get in, involved with um, Mass Audubon is sort of the you know the the main statewide one that that is a really good one but there there are a lot of local bird clubs spread across massachusetts so you know there's a north shore bird club and a south shore bird club and a cape cod bird club um, those tend to be the best ones to sort of get involved on field trips and bird walks um, and uh yeah depending on depending on where you are brookline bird club in the boston area is, is probably the most active active one with a lot of field trips um but it uh yeah, that it's a you know, and and that of course has all changed a little bit in the pandemic. Like, the field trips aren't aren't happening the way they the way they once did, but hopefully hopefully that'll be back. And that is that is a great way to learn. Absolutely. Well, um, we always promise that this bird turning uh, the page turning event is a, a short and sweet event. Um, so I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Marshall, thank you again so much. I personally have just taken so much and learned so much from this presentation. And I have to say that um, after harassing a good friend of mine who is an avid birder um, about what I saw, she she for, she made me download Merlin, um, which I did. And now I lay on my couch and I scroll through it instead of scrolling through social media. And I've been learning so much. So <laughs> it's much healthier for me. So. Um, so <laughs> So on that personal level, thank you. Um, and uh, again, it's just so wonderful to to, to encounter a Bowdoin alum in so many um, wonderful places and doing so many wonderful things. So so thank you again for your time and um, your presentation. Uh, and thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us. And of course, a major thank you to Tony um, for setting up our webinar and, and helping us get through it all without any tech, technical difficulties. But um, Thank you again and be well all. And we hope to see you back here in May um, with Peter Logan, class of 75, uh, talking some more about um, Audubon and birds. Take care all. Great, thanks so much. Thank you.